So now we're zooming way back out again. Now we're going to look at the structure of, uh, of solids. Um, we're not going to spend a great deal of time at all <coughs> on liquids, actually, during this module. Uh, we've defined what they are, but a lot of what we say <coughs> about solids in a generic sense, so the interatomic forces and potentials and so on that we've also looked at pertain to liquids just as they pertain to solids. Um, but we're going to focus very much now on solids. Later on, we're going to look in, in some detail at gases because they're quite useful as well. Uh, and we're going to spend most of our time looking at a subset of solids, crystalline solids. And actually, you'll look at this subset for the entire four years you're with us simply because the maths is tractable. Uh, everything is nicely ordered. The atoms sit in a very well-defined arrangement with respect to each other. Right? Very well-defined distances, very well-defined angles, and that's replicated throughout the entire crystal. It's why crystal have, crystals have facets, why they can be cleaved, why they look a particular shape uh, you know, in, the, in the bulk. It's because at the microscopic level, all of these atomic arrangements are regular and precise and replicated throughout. Um, there is another huge class uh, of solids, right? the amorphous solids, where we don't have that regular arrangement of atoms. So window glass, <coughs> for instance, is an amorphous solid. It's not crystalline. Uh, and actually, most of the universe is non-crystalline. But the crystalline ones, just like Bohr theory, in relation to full-blown quantum mechanics, looking at crystalline solids is going to be a really, really, really useful way to get entry into understanding the physics of materials in general. All right, so it's quite an important thing that we do. All right, now, there's lots of different types of crystal structure. We're only going to look at a few, a few basic principal ones. Uh, but they all have in common a couple of couple of terms. Uh, and one is the lattice. And the lattice is simply the framework on which the atoms sit. So it's, it's the defining uh, structure of the crystal. All right, what sort of lattice is it? Is it cubic? Is it hexagonal? Whatever you know, question we might ask. All right, so think of this as the framework for the whole thing. Thank you very much. Um, and within that, and at the smaller scale, we have something called the unit cell. Now, the unit cell is just the smallest identifiable unit of our lattice. Okay? So it's the smallest building block, if you like, that we can put together, stack together, to fill space and to create the full lattice that is our crystal. Okay, so we've got unit cells... Uh, and, uh, and lattices as our two principal terms. So the two variants of that that are shown on the screen there uh, on the left uh, is what's called a simple cubic lattice. The unit cells are cubes and they all stack together to produce this simple cubic uh, crystal structure. Uh, and then on the right there's a hexagonal unit cell. And again, they stack together uh, to fill space in three dimensions and produce uh, the crystalline lattice. Now, these things, I mean, this is just a pre picture, <coughs> nothing more than that, but, you know, these things can grow <coughs> to be any size, actually. They fall apart eventually simply because of gravity, right? They can't hold together. Um, you know, but these crystals, gypsum crystals, uh, are, as you can see, three, four, five metres uh, in length and probably half a metre across. Uh, they're absolutely <coughs> enormous. And at every point, again, on the atomic scale, at every point, they are made up just of a stacking of whatever unit cell is associated with the gypsum lattice. It's just piled up according to the lattice framework. Um, so you can imagine how many interatomic distances there are in a five meter long crystal. Right, it's huge. 
spacings between atoms are of the order of 10 to the minus 10 of a meter, right? Uh, we've got 5 meters, so we've got over 10 to the 10 <coughs> unit cells from one end to the other. All having atoms in precisely the same relationship to one another are all stacked uh, themselves on a lattice that is constant and fixed from one end to the other. Um, so that's our crystal. Okay, let's talk about some of the different types. Um, well, simple cubic is, as the name implies, the <coughs> simplest place to start. It is just a cube with an atom on each corner. Um, the diagram with the white background there is essentially just showing the geometry. Okay, uh, but you know we have to bear in mind that we're talking about arrangements of space-filling <laughs> atoms here, right? Defined radius according to the <coughs> um, the orbit of the uh, of the um, most outside electrons, if I can put it that way. So the blue atoms picked <coughs> out on the right there are just showing one unit cell of this simple cubic crystal. Um, a variant on that, very common one, actually is the uh, body center cubic. So it's exactly the same as the simple cubic with the addition of another atom in the center of the cube. Okay, so the unit cell there is as shown uh, on the diagram. Um, and the name pretty much gives away what the arrangement is. Right? Body center cubic, there's an atom at the body's center. Um, face center cubic, another very, very common one. Uh, the diagrams for that are on the right of the screen. Um, we've still started with our simple cubic, so a cube with an atom on each of the corners. But now there's an additional atom in the center of all six faces of our cube. <coughs> Okay, so it's getting a little bit more complicated now. There's quite a few metals that adopt this one. Aluminium is the example I've given on the screen, but if you look at metals like iron, for instance, then depending on the temperature of the iron, it can either be BCC, body center cubic, or FCC, face center cubic. It'll change its crystal structure with temperature. Uh, there's another variant uh, on this that we need to think about. Um, called hexagonal close packing and this mm, <coughs> to get a really good 3D impression of what this is about you would need to at least know what I'm talking about if I talk about billiard balls um, if you imagine atoms like that the closest you can <coughs> pack billiard balls together if you imagine one in the center you'd then get a ring of six around it that were all touching Right? No more than six. So now imagine another set of those stacked on top. Well, actually, the most stable position is not directly above the balls underneath, but actually shifted so the balls on top sit in the dips created by the ones underneath. So that's usually the minimum energy relationship between one layer and another. But that's hexagonal close packed. <coughs> And again, there are some metals that adopt that sort of packing. Uh, this isn't a crystal structure per se, but it's a very important arrangement of atoms. You generally describe it in terms of the other ones that we've just looked at. But a tetrahedral relationship is something that governs a huge amount of important stuff in the world. All right? It's the way we manage to get that huge number of carbon atoms per unit volume in diamond crystals, right? a calculation you've already done a few weeks ago. Um, it's also what governs the structure of materials like silicon. Okay, so if I, I mean this is, this is my very crude example of a tetrahedral arrangement. Right? This is silica. So <coughs> the central atom here is supposed to be a silicon atom and the four whites are oxygens. Okay, so that's how silica would normally operate. It's a regular tetrahedron. All the angles are the same, all the distances are the same, um, and we can build up a crystalline 
<laughs> you can see this is a very crude um, system. I lost one of my little springs and they're very hard to replace, believe it or not, these days. We can build up a crystal with these actually really very readily. Right? Silicon atoms actually join through an intermediate oxygen. Right? So if we took that as a building block, as a unit cell, right, we could add another one on like that. Right? Now if they're all lined up like that, or another common one is to have them offset so that one is um, in antiphase to the other in terms of the angles. Right? We can replicate that in three dimensions and produce a crystalline material. And in fact, the crystalline material we produce um, is quartz. All right? So this is a crystal based on that arrangement of atoms. And you can see the typical sort of regular facets and faces um, that you would associate with a crystal. All right? So that's just silicon dioxide, silicon and oxygen. Right, grown in this tetrahedral arrangement to make a crystal uh, of that sort. Right. Now, let's dive back in again. We've already mentioned the unit cell and what it is. I've already made the point that, you know, we can draw simplistic diagrams, but we have to think in terms of, of atoms filling space. So, if we've got a crystalline material, if we've got a lattice, that just contains stacks of these unit cells, then that's what we have to keep in mind, okay? Yeah. As long as there's not a body on the floor, that's just fine. Good. Um, so here's our body centre cubic arrangement, for instance. We've got atoms on the corners of our cube, and you'll notice that they're chopped up. And they're chopped up, of course, because there's another neighbouring unit cell here and here and on all the six faces. So the atoms on the corners of that cube are actually shared with their neighbours. Right? Anyone good at thinking in 3D? How many unit cells is this particular atom sharing itself with? Advance on six. Eight. eight. It is eight. All right. You may need to go out and buy a box of Lego to convince yourself that that is true, but it's it's eight. Okay, so we've got <coughs> one eighth of an atom associated with that particular lattice point, that particular point on the lattice. Right, we get the whole one in the centre, obviously, in our unit cell. It's not sharing itself with anything other than that one unit cell. But these ones on the corners <coughs> are actually sharing with each of them, sharing with another eight unit cells. So actually, in our unit cell, we can only count one eighth of each of those. And we have eight of them. So in fact, that unit cell effectively holds <coughs> two atoms, one in the centre and eight eighths for the corners of the cube. Yeah? In the face centre cubic, same argument applies. All right? On the corners, we've got <coughs> one eighth of an atom because it's sharing with the unit cells next to it. Uh, and on each of the faces, we've got half an atom. Right? Because it's also shared with whatever, uh, with the unit cell that's actually abutted against that particular face. So we've got one atom effectively from the corners, eight eighths, and we've got six over two atoms for the faces of the cube. All right? So one plus three, we've got four atoms in total associated with a BCC unit cell. And those are quite important calculations in the end. Those are just going back to the billiard balls picture I gave you earlier. This is a, an image of hexagonal close packing uh, on the right here. And I don't know what that one is. I can't remember why I put it in. doesn't matter. Um, I said crystalline materials were useful and you will focus a great deal on them. 
um, and you certainly will in one guise or another as we go through. In fact, all the way through to stage three, you'll still be talking about crystalline uh, materials in terms of conductivity, um, vibrations going through the materials, all sorts of stuff because it is actually very useful as a way of getting started. But there is a lot of amorphous stuff around. I've already mentioned uh, plate glass, for instance. Right? The picture in the middle is, although it's probably quite tough to pick out in this lighting, but it's showing a sheet of plate glass floating on a bath of molten uh, tin, right? which is the process that was invented in the UK by um, Alistair Pilkington in the 1950s. Right. It was the start of cheap, reliable, controllable plate glass. Um, and it really is putting the melt, the glass melt, floating it on a bed of liquid metal. So you necessarily therefore get something that's flat and smooth, and then you roll it off the other end, uh, and it comes out as a sheet of plate glass. All we've got to do is cut the strips up now to whatever size you want. Um, and this is a. Um, I'm going to take the lights off a little bit, um, just so you can pick this out. Can you st still see <coughs> to take notes and stuff? Okay. Um, this is actually a computer-generated model, but nevertheless, it's okay. Of silica, amorphous silica in this case, so not a crystalline lattice. Same rules apply at the local level because everything in terms of, of the relationship between the atoms is still governed by the outermost electrons. The other things driving the chemistry, the other things driving the interatomic force and potential energy curves. Okay? Um, so you remember in our crystalline model we had a silicon atom surrounded by four oxygens. Yes? And we have one oxygen that was connected to two silicon atoms. Right? Wherever we went, that was true. And the same is actually true of an amorphous material. So if I can pick them out, yellow in this case is silicon, red is um, uh, oxygen. So let me try and find one that's vaguely visible. This <coughs> one's not doing too bad. But you could, and maybe you can't see that at the back, but you can count exactly the same thing because it's being driven by the same forces, the same basic chemistry. We've still got a silicon atom surrounded by four oxygens and an oxygen that connects to two silicons. And that's still building up the network. The difference now is that there is a slight flexibility in the separation between the atoms. And I'm talking slight, 1%. All right, that's all. But the big thing is that there's about a 10% variation in that angle. And providing you allow that variation, that is enough to destroy the lattice. It is no longer possible to say, I know where the atoms are at this end of my material, therefore I can predict precisely where the atoms are at the other end. Because here they're no longer sitting on this perfectly replicated lattice. That slight variation, that 10 degree wobble, if you like, in the angle between one of these units and the next one is enough to destroy the lattice. So the same basic chemistry is applying, but the end result in terms of the arrangement of atoms is quite, quite different. And again, there's plenty of this stuff around in, in nature. Um, and this, believe it or not, is a volcanic glass. It's something called obsidian. Um, let's turn these lights back on again. Shall we? Um, it's black just because there's a small amount of iron contamination in here, but chemically it is, to all intents and purposes, exactly the same as that. But this lacks the crystal structure that this has. Right? So they're almost the same, except one is crystalline, one is non-crystalline, it's amorphous. <coughs> Right, hugely important uh, difference. Um, as I say, that came out of a volcano, and the key that gives you a bit of a clue actually is the difference between the two. Crystals of silica take a long, long time to grow, geological times to grow. 
right? When we're cooling something down, we actually need that cooling rate to be slow enough for the atoms to arrange themselves on, on a lattice. It is the place they're trying to go. It is the place of lowest energy, which is what everything is you know, going to try and get to, as it were. But if you cool it fast enough, the atoms cease to have the energy to move and arrange themselves in that regular way. Right? All they've got time to do is to grab local atoms, you know, driven by these basic chemical forces, um, and you know, stay in that essential relationship. So a volcano is a is a great way of producing a glass. You spew out this molten stuff, right? And as a fluid, as you know from the definition of, of liquids, the atoms or the molecules are now relatively free to tumble and move and slide past each other, and then you let it cool. And from a volcano, the cooling rate is quite often so low, uh, so slow, I beg your pardon, um, no, other way around, so fast uh, in the context of this stuff that the atoms don't have time to crystallize. So you don't get quartz, you get obsidian instead. All right, there are other ways of doing it. Meteorite strikes on, you know, into sand. <coughs> All right, sand is just silica, it's the basic ingredient of a glass. Uh, will cause immediate high temperatures at the impact site, throw loads of spray up into the atmosphere. Each of those liquid droplets will then cool and fall back to Earth. So we get things called tectites. Right? And this is one of them. This is actually um, from Arizona, which is near where I used to work. Uh, and there's lots of local legends associated with these things. It's actually called Apache Tears, and I won't tell you the story because it's not really part of PH026. Um, but it's quite a neat story. But this also is, is, is actually quite pure silica. There's a bit of surface contamination, right? It hit the ground, it got a bit of chemical nonsense on the surface. Um, but again, I'm going to have to come around the other side probably to do this. Um, if I shine my laser pointer through it, you'll see actually that um, it's actually reasonably transparent. Can you see that in the back? If I sliced off the surfaces, it would be a really clear, high quality glass. Silicon glass. It's just got this surface muck on it. Um, so again, you know, cooling at a rate that allowed uh, the atoms to coalesce in terms of chemical forces and form a solid, but not slow enough that they could arrange themselves into a crystalline structure. <coughs> okay. Right, different materials. This is just a brief skip through. <coughs> that clock is still ten minutes out, isn't it? We're in week five and it's still telling the wrong time. Amazing. Um, which is now recorded. Oh dear. Um, anyway, polymers. Right? Polymers uh, you'll have all come across in one form or another. Most of us are wearing polymers and even if we're not, our bodies are composed very largely of polymeric material. Um, all polymers are, are subunits that have been chemically stitched together. So if we look at polypropylene, um, then we've got single molecules, uh, propene uh, molecules, as shown on the left there, um, at least in terms of its chemical equation, not what it looks like structurally. Uh, and we simply add those together, right, these structural units here, which is exactly the same as that thing over there inside the brackets, right? One joins on to the next, which joins on to the next, and so on and so on. Right, so we build up a long chain of stuff. So the carrier bags that you take out of um, you know, the shop on campus or Sainsbury's or Tesco or wherever it is you do your shopping uh, are mostly made of polythene, which is a shortening, shortened version of polyethylene. Right? So it's just ethylene molecules that have all been stitched together to form these long chains, right, which gives you a material that's got the useful uh, properties that, that we like. Um, PTFE, 
Teflon right, is another one. So your non-stick cookware, uh, for instance, is all coated with this stuff. And again, it's, it's just a chain of carbon atoms with bits stuck off the side. And carbon has this very useful property that we can then knit them all together to produce long chains of material. You can do it with silicon as well, actually. Um, and silicon-based polymers are actually quite important for specialised uses. Um, and there's a whole load of this stuff, right? Nylons, rubbers, everything you can think of, um, you know, in terms of modern life, has owns a lot of its its pedigree to polymers and polymerization reactions. Uh, and in the natural world, the same is true, right? Look at cellulose in trees, in cotton, in anything else you like. Uh, it's all polymer chain, or a lot of it is polymer chain. Now, polymers are usually amorphous, but you can produce a semblance of order, of crystallinity in these things. So if you've got an elastic band and you stretch it, uh, you know, to the point just short of breaking it, um, what you've done in effect is taken these curled up, coiled polymer molecules and straighten them out, or at least partially straighten them out. So you've got some sense of order now in the sense that the polymers, polymer fibers are all sort of lined up in the same direction. But that's pretty much as far as it goes. They are mostly amorphous materials. 